Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon, and I'm the Dean of Graduate Studies at Charles Darwin University. Welcome to Outrider 37, Use the Difficulty. This is part of an important trilogy that we're going to action, but more of that in a second. We all know at the moment that life is really hard, really hard. Being in work is hard. Being out of work is incredibly hard. Being in a PhD program is really tough. And deciding to leave a PhD program is also really tough. And I think the challenge is, and I've thought a lot about this, I think the challenge of what is making the now so difficult is all of us are making decisions, we're making choices in substandard, reasonably toxic contexts and environments. So we're not really making good choices or good decisions because we're making decisions in these tough, unstable, volatile spaces and jobs and positions and lives. And there are no easy choices or decisions anymore. And that's why people like you are so courageous, so inspirational, because you wake up every morning and you make the tough decision to do research, to be a researcher and to transcend yourself. And so what I hope this trilogy that I've constructed for you will enable is it may provide the spark or the spine to give you confidence in these difficult times to continue to make these decisions. So we're starting in this trilogy with use the difficulty. Then the next edition, the next episode is put the problem into the work. And we finish with the obstacle is the way. So together what I hope we can do in this trilogy is provide an inspiration, but also provide a framework to manage the problems, the difficulties, the concerns that emerge every day. And there are no good or clean choices to make. We're making substandard choices in difficult times. So what I want to try and do is help us reframe this context, reframe these decisions, and use the difficulty so that we use the grit and we show confidence and courage and gumption. Now, this vlog trilogy is dedicated to three people, to Noor, to Shelley, and to Saji. I've had the incredible privilege of working with them and meeting them in the last few months. And you remain an absolute inspiration to me. You have walked through incredibly difficult times and you've stood up and you've kept walking. You are the best of what our doctoral program at CDU is and I am so incredibly proud of you. So I dedicate this series to you. And Shelley, yes, I know you've just heard your name shouted out while you're listening to the video in the car. Hi, Shelley. So let's talk about the phrase, use the difficulty. And let's take that phrase for a walk in our lives this week. Let's do it. Now, the phrase comes from an unusual source, use the difficulty. It comes from Michael Caine. Now, all week I've promised myself, Tara, do not do a Michael Caine impersonation. You can feel me going into it then. I will not do a Michael Caine impersonation, I promise you. But yes, it comes from Michael Caine. And this phrase, use the difficulty, was explored in some depth in an interview that he conducted on The Parkinson Show with, of course, Michael Parkinson. And whatever you may think about Michael Caine or indeed Michael Parkinson, my life really changed before and to after I heard this phrase. It changed everything for me. So Michael Caine explained to Michael Parkinson that he got this phrase from when he was a young actor and he was rehearsing in a play and he was backstage, you know, a minor player, backstage waiting to enter the stage during this rehearsal. And there was this scene playing out between a husband and wife and it got increasingly agitated and volatile and the husband threw a chair. 
maybe at the wife, I don't know, but through a chair. And the chair sort of lodged in front of the door where Michael Caine was meant to enter the stage. And so the very young Michael Caine wondered what to do. And at the end, when his entrance sort of happened, he poked his head around the door and said to the director, Sir, I'm so sorry, I can't get on the stage. The director looked a bit confused for a moment and then saw the chair and said to the young Michael Caine, use the difficulty, use the difficulty. If this is a comedy, fall over the chair. If it's a tragedy or a drama, pick the chair up and throw it at something, break the chair. Now, Michael Caine has gone on to apply this maxim not only in his acting career, but in the rest of his professional and personal life. Use the difficulty. Work out what we can get out of this difficult situation. Now, he argues that if we get 1% out of this situation when we've used the difficulty, you've won because you have not been stopped by the difficulty and you've continued to move and gain momentum. This idea of using the difficulty seems antithetical in our current age because basically everything that exists in late capitalism exists to make us comfortable and happy and satiated. Now, Amanda Lang, a great business journalist, can I say, wrote a, a remarkable book called The Beauty of Discomfort. I want to get the subtitle right. How what we avoid is what we need. <laughs> now, she shows how the discomfort, how the difficulty is instructive, her quote. Now, of course, we know this from learning theory, from Vygotsky's zone of proximal development. We know this. And, of course, the zone of proximal development is the space between being able to do something with ease and without assistance and support and not really being able to do something without assistance and support. And the zone of proximal development is in between. And that, of course, is where learning occurs. Now, in higher degree supervision, that's a very delicate dance between acknowledging the expertise of the student, that they know what they're doing, and then know when the supervisor has to be that guide on the side and walk with the student. It's a very, very delicate dance. In the ZPD, that is the space for difficulty. That is also the space that we use, the difficulty that we use for learning. But of course, we're not only learning about content here. We're also learning other things. We're learning to move outside of comfort. We learn about how to sit in discomfort, to sit in disagreement and aggression and anger and fear and name calling. Now, none of this bullying toxic culture should be necessary. We know that. But that is our reality. These are not nice benevolent and kind times. These are ruthless times. These are nasty times. And the people that survive and thrive are not nasty, but they're able to use the difficulty. And it is clear that when all of us learn to live in and with discomfort, we not only learn to withstand the difficulty, but we actually become more comfortable with change. And we start to rewrite and revision change as a learning moment. So we can't control events. We can't control our context, but we can control our emotions and our response to those events and that context. Now, a decade ago, in fact, I can tell you the year, it was 2011, in one of my really, really debilitating jobs, and I've had a lot of them, but in that year, 2011, I started to change my language. 
I move from going, oh, this is difficult, this is hard, this is impossible. I use, what do I do? And panic and stuff. And I started to change my language from a language of fear to a language of learning. You see, whenever I, to this day, hit a difficulty or a problem, I take a pause I say, what a gift this is. What a gift this is. It's my birthday today, by the way. So I can say at 55 years of age, my goodness me, how have I lived this long? Uh, at 55 years of age, what a gift it is after all this time and all this life lived that something's happening that I don't know what's happening and I'll have to learn to management. So manage it. So we change the language of difficulty into the language of learning. And I've learnt very clearly to express gratitude for that learning and the people who teach me. And of course, the wonderful Fiona Steele, hi Fee, my wonderful husband, Jamie Quinton, they teach me a lot. And I try every day when, oh, I don't know what's happening and they teach me something. And I always say, thank you for that learning. Thank you for taking the time and teaching me something that I didn't know. And see how that language alters how you approach the world. It also enables you to control your emotions. So the difficulty is a moment. The difficulty is a gift. And let me tell you why. Because it moves us all out of our comfort zone. It is a moment where we have to fight self-doubt. We have to work out who the hell we are and we reframe the difficulty into a moment of learning. Now, if we reframe the difficulty, then suddenly it becomes normal and it becomes helpful. Because you see, every difficulty is an emotional moment. Every difficulty is an opportunity to grow, to think, to stretch and transcend. And this is what Seligman's research, where he described it as learned optimism. Now, I'm an old goth, right? So optimism freaks me out. But I love this idea of this learned optimism. So we think constructively about the past, which enables us to think optimistically about the future. I love that idea. Whatever's happened in the past, we approach it constructively useful trope. Now this process requires what Lang described as quote depersonalizing criticism even especially even when the criticism is personal. End of quote. Now this is how I as Dean uh, manage cultures of exploitation. You see th what my job is is I, on a daily basis, confront supervisors and advisors who do not want to abide by policies and procedures and governance. They want to do their own thing. And the reason they want to be free and do their own thing, I'm sure there are many reasons, but one clear one is so that the exploitation of students can continue. Now, I receive a lot of personal abuse a lot and I and I received that abuse, abuse and all those l labels and name calling and stuff because I intervene in cultures of exploitation right and of course I use the difficulty you've seen me do it I mobilize the difficulty all the weird stuff that happens to me I use the stories as learning and teachable moments to talk about research integrity and research misconduct, sexual assault, sexual abuse and bullying. I am very comfortable, so comfortable, sitting in a name calling space. I'm comfortable sitting in an abuse space. Why? Because I don't live my life for the approval of other people. Do you? Do you require the approval of other people to give your life meaning? Now, I want you to ponder that question through the trilogy that we're enacting this year. The gift of a difficulty 
is it unsettles, it agitates your naturalised mode of thinking. It challenges assumptions, it raises really, really uncomfortable questions for you. And of course, all of this is incredibly important to doctoral education. The great challenge of a PhD and PhD supervision is that data set of one how we manage students, how we manage supervisors who endlessly say, when I did my PhD, when I did my PhD, ignoring doctoral studies, ignoring all the PhD research and just focusing on themselves. A data set of one like that is remotely generalisable. So we now have a problem. We've got lots of problems in our universities at the moment. But one of the problems in our universities at the moment is we have a group, it's an increasingly small group, can I say, but a group of supervisors and students who have had this incredibly narrow experience, have only worked at very, very, very few universities and only publish in very, very, very few journals. And indeed, the students, through homology, just are trying to replicate the career of their supervisors. So we have this small group in our universities that live in this incredibly confident and comfortable space. And of course, they haven't been tested at all. They've just lived through their expectations and remained reasonably comfortable, often in tenured roles. But then, of course, something terrible happens. And trust me, something terrible is happening to everybody. It may be a restructure, and then another restructure, and then another restructure. It may be COVID. <laughs> it may be a war, and then another war, and then another war. Or indeed, the soft money magically disappears. And the methodologies that have been deployed for 20 years can no longer be enacted because they can no longer be afforded. The equipment can't be repaired. So the gift of the difficulty is that we have to realise that our data set of one is just a data set of one. And when we did our PhD, that is completely irrelevant to what is happening now. We have to explore what is true. We have to explore what we fear. Now Lang stated, and this phrase changed my life, can I say, Lang stated, quote, we make up what we believe to be true in our social world, end of quote. We make up what we believe to be true. Wow. So the gift of the difficulty is that it shows that this personal experience is not true. It reveals our emotional state, our assumptions, our ideological blind spots. The difficulty opens up new spaces beyond who we think we should be, beyond who we think we are, and creates a new space for different decisions. Now, I know we all want easy absolutes. We want to live our life and make choices in comfort. We have built entire industries to stop ourselves feeling discomfort, feeling a difficulty, confronting a problem. You think about it, stress, discomfort, fear, anger. How often do we avoid that? How often does our culture encourage us to avoid the difficult moment? And if you think about it, work is work. And what I want for you, for myself, for all of us, I want us to understand work. Work is work. It is not leisure. The people you work with, they are not your family. We need to understand the nature of work in our now. And the difficulties remind us that happiness and comfort are not the goal. Farrah Storr argued that success emerges when, quote, we get uncomfortable with the uncomfortable, end of quote. Poof. We get uncomfortable with the uncomfortable. Yes, that quote is correct. And I've used it a lot. I'm currently doing some work on Lewis Capaldi. 
and I'm riding on him at the moment. I think what makes his songwriting so remarkable, what makes his life so remarkable, is he remains uncomfortable with the uncomfortable. For those of us who are researchers, therefore, let's start to work on our self-talk. When you feel yourself saying, I'm stressed, I'm so busy, I'm struggling, I want you to change that language for me. I'm learning something, I am efficient, I am kicking goals. My life, including my professional life, has been unbelievably difficult. As I said to you, today is my birthday. I think it's the first time I've recorded one of these videos on my birthday. And can I say, looking back on my life from my birthday, none of these jobs that I've been in, and this is my 10th job, none of these jobs have been comfortable, none of these jobs have been easy, and indeed some of these jobs have been absolutely catastrophic. But what I've learned from these difficulties, as an old lady, what I've learned from these difficulties is how to handle difficulties. There is a difficulty literacy. You learn how to handle difficulty. Whatever comes at you, you've seen it before. And you know what went right and wrong last time, and you're ready to make a decision. And what's happened through all those difficulties and catastrophes is that nothing frightens me and no one frightens me. And look, on a daily basis, people try to intimidate me. They try to frighten me. <laughs> and there are two reasons that they fail every time. The first reason is my sense of self is not shaped or determined by the opinions of other people. And the second reason is that all the difficulties I've experienced have taught me how to manage difficulties. So this means as a supervisor, I can help my students use the difficulty. Now, I think COVID was a key moment of reflection here. There are still students in 2024 who use COVID as the excuse why they have not finished. 2024. Now, I had the privilege of working with, as a dean, but also as a supervisor, so many remarkable students who took a different road, who decided to use the difficulty. And what those students did is they assessed the situation in March 2020, ethics modification, ethics modification, ethics modification, read about new methodology, understand ontology, bang, 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 bang and they finish their PhD, they finish their research in three years. So the students that sat in the no, in the negation, in the difficulty, they did not finish. The students who understood the difficulty of COVID and used the difficulty in their PhD made the changes quickly and it actually made their career. You see, the students who were able to use COVID, use the difficulty were incredibly successful. And I'll use two of my great students, former students, Aidan Cornelius Bell and the wonderful Alyssa Armstrong, doctors both. And they both, they gobbled up the difficulty of COVID. This is great, that's great, let's use this. And they developed brand new methodologies and ethics modifications and they got, they worked really, really hard. They worked really, really hard and they finished in three years and the examiners, when they read their theses, lost their minds with the scale of their innovation and reflection and their gumption and their courage and their brilliance. They used the difficulty. The thesis improved because of COVID. And the other bizarre thing was we finished the theses, the theses went out to examiners. Both of them got a high paying permanent job before the examiner reports were returned. Because their employers, as much as their examiners, appreciated and acknowledged their reflexivity, their capacity to manage change. So they finished in three years because they used the difficulty. And they were rewarded because they demonstrated rigor and dexterity. Now, it is amazing still in 2024 
that I hear students talk about COVID as the reason why they have not submitted their thesis. Now, that may be true. That may be true. But in a competitive environment for jobs, would you hire the student who triumphed through COVID and used the difficulty to be innovative? Or would you hire the student that's still enrolled, explaining that they didn't make any changes through the pandemic, that their PhD really had to remain the same, even though the rest of the world changed? Now, I know this is a tough truth, this one, but I'm presenting it for your consideration because every job, every application that comes up to work in a university, we receive hundreds, hundreds of applications. Hundreds of remarkable people from around the world apply for every job. So you've got a choice. Would you hire the person that used the difficulty from COVID or hire the person who's still complaining about COVID and remains locked in their reality and their truth rather than the actual reality and the actual truth. From using the difficulty this week, next week we're going to learn how to put the problem into your work. But therefore this week, let's focus on making meaning, creating momentum, and using the difficulty. I wish you love, light, and peace. Tea out.